Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event. Uh, this is a guide to mission control for small satellites by KP Labs. Throughout the event today, the chat function will be um, open if you'd like to communicate with each other. And if you have, uh, if you'd like to ask any questions of, of our speaker today, Martin, then please use the Q&A function. Although if you do put questions in chat by accident, I will, uh, I will see those as well. But yeah, preferably use the Q&A function and these will be addressed uh, as much as possible, as many as we can get through at the end of the event today. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we'll we'll send you out a follow up message via the via Zoom with a link to that recording once it's processed uh, in order for, for you and anybody who um, any of your colleagues who maybe couldn't make it today uh, can can review the material. So, yeah, just like to say thank you very much for for spending time here with us today at, uh, at Satish. We are very pleased to be able to have these opportunities to try and educate and inform the, the industry about important upcoming trending topics, the things that you may need to know about, things that you might want to factor into your own missions. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to our speaker today, uh, Martin Drobik from KP Labs, and he's going to discuss to, with you the topic that you can see on the screen. So Martin, please take it away. Yeah, thanks, thanks. So, um, hi everyone. As uh, being said, my name is Martin Drobik and I'm, I'm a head of our flight software team at uh, Cape Labs. And today I'll be uh, talking about um, Oryx, uh, which is our uh, flight software development kit. And uh, I'll be presenting what kind of uh, elements goes into the software development kit that we have prepared and how you could uh, use it in your missions. Uh, before I do that, I will shortly introduce uh, our company and then have a few words about maybe some kind of uh, uh, design decisions that were made uh, so you can understand where we are coming from with uh, our design of, uh, of Oryx. So, um, uh, so KP Labs, um, we are a small company from, from Poland. We are located in, in Gliwice in a beautiful office building. We just, uh, two days ago, we moved in, uh, where we have many uh, facilities, uh, many labs uh, that uh, help us um, do what we do, create uh, space missions. Uh, we can't employ a bit over 70 uh, people uh, from many different uh, areas, so from from uh, many me mechanical, thermal, optical engineering, through uh, through electronic engineers, through uh, software engineers like myself, and we also have a large team connected with uh, algorithms, with uh, AI, and stuff like that. So there are lots of people, uh, uh, lots of topics uh, covered by those uh, seventy people. Um, we operate since 2016. Um, we have a status of a research and development center. That means that uh, we publish uh, in scientific journals, uh, and uh, our our team members are on a, on a, on a science conferences. Uh, so if you are uh, if you are, for example, on uh, on uh, this year's uh, IAC, then uh, you will see some of our team members there as well. Um, KP Labs has like four main areas when we when we work with our projects and our products. Uh, we we deal with uh, images, both uh, upstream and downstream Im imaging. So we we have uh, teams that we have a projects that uh, handle. Uh, handle data on ground, but we also work heavily on data processing on board. Uh, we do large part of what we do is connected to software. This is what I'm talking uh, today about. So I will leave more details uh, to the rest of the presentation. Uh, computing, uh, a big part of our product line are, uh, are um, data processing units that you can use uh, on board to uh, process data. And kind of supplementary, supplementary to that, we deal with uh, with uh, with algorithms. So we have both like more classic computer vision uh, algorithms to like pre-process your data, but also uh, more mod modern, let's say, uh, machine learning based algorithms that you could use on board uh, our uh, DPUs to to process the data. But also some of the projects are for uh, processing the data uh, on ground. So. Uh, 
that's a short introduction of what we do. If you will have more questions about us, then uh, don't hesitate to contact or to uh, ask us questions. So uh, let's jump to Oryx. What is Oryx? Uh, the topic of our today's presentation. So um, as I said, Oryx is a software development kit, but that really doesn't mean a lot, right? So uh, there are many things that can be put into a SDK software development kit label. So um, for as, as I tried to kind of put it in simple sentence, I would say that Oryx is a set of tools that helps creating uh, fu functionality uh, uh, of a flight software computer, but also helps integrating this software into, uh, into mission, into mission lifecycle, uh, and helps integrating the, the onboard computer with the rest of the mission. Um, so that's a very broad definition. Um, we have like three main uh, categories of things that goes into the Oryx. So first, first of all, there's a there's a big uh, big um, set of um, C++ modules that create the flight software functionality. So you can pick the functions that you pick the modules, pick the libraries that you want to use, and um, kind of forge the 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 final software uh, from them. Uh, there are many of them. I will briefly discuss them also at the end of the presentation. Uh, and you know, hopefully, give you an example of how how they they are used. Uh, the second big area we cover are the tools that are used to both develop but also to to integrate the the software. Uh, and uh, this is probably the main topic of today's presentation, actually. Uh, so I will be covering this in a, mm, more detail in a minute. And uh, the third, the the last thing, the third thing is is our EGC. So this is a hardware, um, hardware uh, board that is used in conjunction with the, with the development tools and can be used also in conjunction with the C++ libraries. Um, okay, so uh, b before I, I go into the details on how, how you could use Oryx and what exactly tools do we, do we have in Oryx, I just want to briefly describe like uh, two or three major design principles that we used uh, when we created this and where, where are we coming from in, in that way. So um, I've mentioned that Oryx, uh, especially the, develop, the tools in Oryx are, are handy when you, when you want to integrate the software and the onboard computer, whatever the onboard computer is doing, right? It can be payload computer, it can be common data handling computer, whatever you want. Uh, it, they are handy when integrating the, the onboard computer into your, your mission. And uh, I just wanted to give you an, 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 an context of where we are coming from as a software engineers. So uh, in software engineering, there is a term called continuous integration, which has been coined over 30 years ago. So for software engineering, that's not, not that, uh, so that, that, that's a long history, right? Because from 60s to 80s, 90s, that's, that's half of the history of software engineering, probably. Uh, so, if we would look at like a big project in the uh, 70s and or 80s uh, that involved many teams, many software engineers working on a single uh, product, uh, we we would notice that they they mo most of the teams, most of software engineers, for the most part, will will work in isol isolation, meaning they will work on some like selected area of functionality. And then uh, not that often they would just come together and try to uh, try to uh, launch the entire thing, the entire system with all the changes that each of them individually made. Uh, this, this, this coming together is called integration in software. It's very similar to integration you see in uh, every, every engineering project. Uh, the only difference is that there is nothing tangible usually. There's a software, so it's, it has not like you know, physical boundaries. So it leaves uh, each engineering team with uh, many possibilities of integration with others. There's, there are no restrictions really. So there are probably hundreds of way two pieces of software can integrate uh, to, together, which makes it, well, a bit complicated, right? Um, and uh, what people have found is that the longer you kind of delay the integration, uh, 
the more the more probable is that you find uh, some some issue some problem after the integration that will be so severe that it will require to go back and kind of redo um, part of the work uh, which incurs huge huge uh, like cost for the project um, so in uh, in in the beginnings of 1990s uh, people coined the term continuous integration uh, where it was uh, a practice that uh, that kind of uh, it, it tells that you should integrate more often. That that is the, the simplest terms. Uh, it, you should build a software in a way that you kind of add the functionalities like piece by piece and not try, not try to like, build them separately and then uh, try to put them to, together. So th that that was the heart of the co uh, continuous integration. Uh, so they they started to initially to do it more often, like once a week probably and uh, nowadays we do it uh, every time we, we change something so it's 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 gone to very extreme we my team probably integrates uh, 20 30 times per day right now uh, even very com complicated projects so uh, with integration comes another important thing is verification so we have in space we have a phase called uh, AI, AIV uh, assembly integration and verification so you, you have to verify the integrated stuff Without this, it doesn't make much sense, right? Uh, so you, you need to, if you if you integrate, you need to then check if the integrated system works properly. And uh, in software, it, there are very well-known instances of things that worked well in isolation, but totally failed in well, after in, in integration with, with other pieces of software. I'm pretty sure that you could uh, bring up examples for almost every engineering field of that. And usually those, failures are big. I mean, they require a lot of work. So, um, so by integrating uh, more often, you reduce the amount of work that has that you have put to uh, uh, in between the integrations and that reduces the like severity of the errors that you could find because you have more, uh, more continuous feedback uh, on what you, what you are doing. And uh, in modern software engineering, it is uh, considered a, a normal practice to have uh, to integrate all the time and run the automated test suits all the time after every change to give a uh, quick feedback in a matter of minutes, if possible, that you you code you change is okay. You you haven't broken anything new. Um, and such short uh, feedback cycles mean that you can you are very confident about your changes. And if you notice something, you notice it uh, while you still have like a co context loaded in your mind of, of the change. So the, the, the cost of uh, fixing it is relatively low. Um, okay, so this is continuous integration. And, uh, and as you can probably feel already from what I'm saying is that you could actually, uh, the, the, the shortening of the feedback cycle is something you could you could take and just apply to uh, other engineering practices as well. And this is more or less what's, what's being done if you look for uh, like lean engineering, lean uh, production and stuff like that. It's something similar. So uh, it's not, uh, I'm not saying this is uh, specific to software. I mean, the, the software has, I think, specific term for that. Um, but this is where we come from. So this is one of the major uh, design decisions, design principles that we, we, we use is that our software should be able to support that. You should be able to work in that way with, with what we create. So that's one. Uh, there are two other uh, important things, uh, moral assumptions probably that we, we are coming from. Um, this comes from our own observations from the, from the projects that we, 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 have, uh, we have already uh, participated in, uh, both small projects for CubeSats and big for, uh, for, for uh, space agencies. Uh, and the first one is that hardware is scarce. Uh, I haven't seen single project that have like a plenty of hardware you could use for testing. Uh, usually the opposite is true, at least for, from, from our experience. So uh, when we started uh, our mission that's called Intuition One, uh, that's being launched next year, uh, we started it um, three years ago, I think almost four, uh, for the first year, we even didn't have the hardware platform to work on, to write the code for, because it was hard to get the, the, the components. And it was even before the current uh, problem with supply chains. So that was 2018, I think. 
or beginning of 2019. So, uh, uh, so that, that, that's one thing. It's that uh, you know the space hardware is usually very expensive. Uh, you very often work for a projects that have a limited budget and you they won't be buying you know expensive uh, hardware for every uh, engineer that want to do something with it uh, other thing is that um, the lead times for hardware uh, space or not space are very long even without the supply chains problems so if you for example have like a radio equipment it takes a long enough time to 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 order it because you have to go probably through all the legislation related to radio frequency allocation. So you have to actually create that uh, and to be sure what radio you have to order. And this can take years, really. Um, and even if you have your hardware, the hardware you are working with, with your software, then you will never right, probably work in a isolation. You will have to have other uh, subsystems, other you know, sensors, other pieces of hardware that you talk to somehow. And these usually are even more scarce than the, the thing you're working on. So uh, I, I think it's a quite normal in space industry, especially in the CubeSat industry, that you, uh, when the, the flat set, the, 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 the AIV uh, activities are probably the first place when you have all the components on, on the table and you can test them. And that's very late in the project usually. So uh, if you if you wait for that, that's probably not a good idea. You want to start here, right? Um, the second uh, premise we, we, are, uh, we are coming from is that uh, hardware alone is not su sufficient test platform. What I mean by that is that there are many other types of tests and uh, you have to test on hardware, of course, Without that, that doesn't make much sense, but it cannot be the only test you do are doing because there are things you will not be able to test only on hardware. So uh, a specific example, uh, when you look at the usual test cases you have, uh, in gen generally speaking, uh, the test cases usually are have like a free um, areas, right? The, the the first uh, the first what you do in this case is said what is the, the what is the state of the of the of the system before test so what's the uh, what's the what's the state that you are coming from uh, so very often uh, well the, the, there are different ways of naming that they can be like given when then um, arrange act assert or something so this is the, the first step uh, arrange arrange your system in a specific way before you proceed with a test then the test have like has uh, its steps what you have to do to um, for, for the test so you know step by step and then you have like expected results so what is the observable effect of this test and so you can kind of compare what you what you see what you what you get and this is the, the result of the test if you are testing on the hardware you you may have trouble setting it in the correct state so if you for example have a uh, temperature sensors and you test with actual temperature sensors and you want to test what happens in a sub-zero, then you will have to freeze them every time you want to test them, which is of course possible, but it takes it takes resources and time uh, and it's sometimes dangerous. <laughs> and uh, then uh, sometimes hardware will be will be uh, hard to verify, right? So for example, if you have the, the temperature sensors again, Usually they will have like a setting of the of the of how uh, how uh, precise they are, and it's, it's so how do you test if the precision is actually there? Well, if you have if you have hardware, you can probably read it back, but that's not really uh, going to work, right? Well, um, in all situations, so uh, testing with hardware is is hard because you you will not be able to to put it in every possible condition. So uh, a simplest example probably I should start with is uh, testing uh, fault detection, right? So it's very hard to put hardware in a fault uh, state because it's designed to not do that, right? And there are of course ways to inject faults in the hardware, but that's leverage, that, that, that's expensive. Uh, and of course you should do that, but that's, that shouldn't be the only test you, you are doing. Um, okay, so these are the uh, two premises and the, and the overall design uh, goal, goal that we want to have. So we want to 
shorten the, the feedback cycles. We want to be able to work with, in a situation when hardware is scarce for us al almost always. And uh, we treat the hardware as insufficient platform for tests, but necessary. So how do we work in that context? Um, I want to go through five stages of project. And this is what we do for all, all our projects. Uh, five stages of projects and show you how our tools from, from Oryx uh, toolset are kind of helping us to, to achieve what we want. So uh, the first stage is that we start a project and we have absolutely nothing. We have no hardware. We only know probably we, we have some kind of the design, but we probably already know what kind of uh, platform, hardware platform we are working on. Um, so the first thing we will start is to uh, set up a, a, a virtual mach machine uh, that emulates the target platform. So uh, a specific example, Intuition One, I've mentioned uh, our mission that is launched next year, um, uses an onboard computer uh, for command and data handling that's based on Cortex M microcontroller. So uh, what we'll do, we will we we will set up a QEMO, specifically QEMO, which is open source virtual machine, to emulate the Cortex M uh, architecture for us. So uh, we can take uh, entire tool chain for Cort Cortex M and start writing code using that tool chain. Uh, there is an alternative approach that uses uh, compiling for like local PC and. Uh, testing the code on like x86, x64 architecture that's common in modern PCs. However, uh, we, 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 we omit, we don't want to do this because uh, tool chains are very error. Uh, there are errors in tool chains. There are errors in compilers. There are errors in linkers. Uh, you could easily misuse them. And uh, Cortex-M instruction set is totally different than you on your own, own local machine. Uh, there's a different uh, width of the of the address bus. So there are lots of different stuff uh, that affects how your software works. And uh, there's no other way actually to test this to st statistically use it as, as, as much as possible. So we, we've been using the same tool chain in Intuition One for uh, over three years right now. And uh, we are quite confident that we flushed out our important errors and there were many of them especially in linker. Um, so if we just now switch to another tool chain right now before, for example, for, before integration, we wouldn't have this confidence. We would probably find still be finding some bugs uh, while, in, while in orbit, uh, which is not good, of course. Uh, so we call this a single tool chain approach. So you use the same tool chain, uh, target tool chain, the tool chain that we use to create the final flight software from the beginning of the project. Uh, because uh, because you will find some strange errors uh, that way that you could fix on on the ground be before before launching. So um, Oryx comes with a with a tool chain for each uh, platform that that we work with. Uh, there are Cortex M, Cortex R, Cortex A's. Uh, there are Microblazes, uh, Sparks, AVRs. Lots of them. Uh, so if you need to like a specific platform, you can uh, you can leave the platform name in the, in the questions and I will try to answer what to do with this. However, uh, QEMO actually has support for, uh, for, for many, many platforms and we currently use it as our primary virtual uh, machine for emulations. Uh, and this is the first step we have. So at this stage, we have a virtual machine. We can run some, for example, some unit tests. We can run some simple code to verify that the setup works. Well, however, it's kind of, you know, it, it has like limited capabilities because uh, you, you can test probably some like algorithms, you can test some simple procedures, but uh, your code usually will have to like control something, talk to some actuator, read some sensors, talk to the to other subsystems on the satellite. And right now this is not possible. So how do we proceed? So the next big, uh, big thing to do, um, what we do in our projects is, uh, uh, be able to write a code that is somehow communicating with uh, with other with other hardware, uh, and by other hardware, I specifically mean hardware that are not part of the com onboard computer that you are uh, programming. So, if you, for example, have um, I know so 
in, in intuition one, we, we are creating common data hunting uh, unit, which is very chatty thing. So it has to like housekeep all the subsystems in the, in the, on the satellite. So uh, to write the code that, for example, monitors the telemetry for, or from uh, power supply, we have to have the power, power supply somehow. And of course, uh, the it's, it's very hard to get, it's very expensive. So uh, what we will do, we will write a simulator for uh, that acts at this, it looks from the, from the communication protocol perspective, the same as the, as the, um, as the actual device. But this will be running only on the, on the PC. So uh, the, power the power supply from Intuition One, again, as an example, uh, uses, um, uses I2C. For, uh, for for control um, control mechanism control bus, and uh, so we will, what we will do we will actually create something that has the same operations as you can do for through I square C. Of course, it doesn't control anything; it just changes the flex in the memory. But we can then verify if it works correctly, right? We can then set the simulator in a in a in a state we want and see if our uh, if our code reacts. So going back to the uh, to the example with uh, I made with uh, temperature sensors, uh, we could write a, a simulator for a temperature sensor, and then just say, well, if you are asked about temperature, just return minus twenty degrees Celsius, and uh, we can then check if our fault detection mechanism works correctly because I know we should enable heaters in minus twenty or something. Um, and now we can do that easily. And then, of course, we should then later in the project check if this is actually working correctly. But then we can repeat this test uh, with a simulator infinity because it's easy to do. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, so short example. I, I I will try to keep uh, the amount of code as low as possible. This is a Python code. The simulators are written in Python. So it's very easy language to learn and to use. Uh, we have like a ready API uh, in Oryx, so you can easily define new uh, new um, new devices that are simulated. We currently uh, support I square C, CAN, uh, simple GPIOs, URT, and uh, to some extent SPI. That's an asterisk with SPI because uh, it depends on the on the actual uh, protocol, but we can do that as well. Um, yeah. Um, so, and at this point, if you have, uh, okay, so uh, one more thing. So uh, in order to work this way, you have to kind of divide your code into two, two sections. You have to have the section that's kind of uh, encompasses your, your mission. It's like the logic, you know, it's the procedures, the housekeeping, all that stuff is, is, is your mission. And you have to kind of uh, ma make it separate from the uh, actual uh, platform that is working on. So while we are working on virtual machine on QMO, we don't have physical I2C, physical URT. You know, you, you can, there are no pins that you could drive in here. So what we do is uh, we have a, a, a ready to use abstractions of those um, of those peripherals that you could um, use to communicate with the simulators instead of driving something physical. And this is used on um, on Quemo. Um, so this is like there's like a dual. There's like a two at least two um, folders in your code, right? The the one with the common code that's uh, that has all the mission stuff, and the and the second that says which interface is implemented, for example, on Quemo and which on hardware. So. Uh, so at this case, at this point, we have. Um, QMO running your code for your mission, no hardware yet. We have we we are simulating uh, the 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 external uh, devices that you communicate with. No hardware yet. We can write pretty much entire mission code in this way. Uh, test easily test all the different uh, procedures, all the different branches you code uh, gets in an integrated environment. Of course, you can always do that in, in unit tested environment, so in isolation. But here we, we are talking about integrating this and testing it as a, as a whole. Uh, uh, and you could really go far with this. 
However, it has no uh, it has no like sense to do this even without running it on, on actual hardware. So that's the next step: running it on actual hardware. So uh, you take your, your your code, the logic part uh, I've shown on pre previous slide, and you exchange the drivers for a physical driver. So now you say, okay, I square C, you are actually I square C. You will drive some pins on the microcontroller uh, when asked for read or write. Um, and uh, you should be able to uh, to put it on your hardware platform. Uh, and now you are in a big trouble, right? Because you wrote a code that's very chatty, that's very that likes to communicate with other devices. And now you only have uh, your hardware platform, and you probably don't have all the devices around you. You don't have all the sensors, or don't, you don't have like EPS or something. You just have your platform that runs your code. So what do you do? Well, we already written the simulators. Uh, why not to reuse them? And that's exactly what Oryx uh, does. So if you write the simulators with an Oryx simulator API, it actually can, can uh, work with QEMU, but it also can uh, connect to uh, our EGC I mentioned before, the Oasis. So Oasis connects to the PC with a USB cable. And uh, on, on the one uh, side and on the other side, it has a PC104 connector for all the standard CubeSat, uh, CubeSat interfaces. Uh, so on the, on the image here, you can see actually uh, the, the setup we have uh, in Intuition 1. The bottom left, uh, the bottom left board is, uh, is the Oasis board. Uh, you can see the USB connector here. And this is the engineering model of our uh, onboard computer for Intuition 1. So uh, Oasis is like a bridge between the, the, the Python simulators and the physical uh, peripherals of the, uh, of the onboard computer. So it kind of captures the I2C, captures the CAN, GPIO, URT, SPI, and uh, serves, in this case, it serves as a slave. So if OBC wants to read something, for example, from uh, temperature sensors, it will, uh, it will create an uh, I2C transaction uh, that will be captured by the Oasis. The, the transaction will be sent to, the, to the, uh, the same simulator we have already written for QEMU. The answer will be generated, translated again, back to I2C uh, response and sent to the, to the OBC. So from the OBC, from the OBC perspective, it, it looks like it's talking to real hardware. It does, it does talk to real hardware, however, there is no uh, it only talks to, to Oasis. The only difference are timings. Um, going back and forth to PC costs you some time. So as long as you are not in the re real time uh, domain, this will work uh, pretty well. For real time domains, you could actually put the code directly on the Oasis. That's a custom work, but it, it can be done. For most cases, uh, this, this is not a big problem. So, uh, so right now we are in a situation when we have our hardware platform that we are writing code for, that uh, that we can write entire uh, our code. We can run uh, on it even if it connects to the different devices. And if your hardware platform is similar to the flight platform, uh, so it if it has like the same peripherals, it uses the same memory map, etc., etc., then in fact, you are already using your flight software in here. There are no differences. Uh, in this case, in Intuition One, the engineering model uh, of the of the of the onboard computer, the only major difference is that it's lacking the GPS, which should be here, because it's like a military grade GPS, and uh, we only have like I think one currently, so it's just lacking it. But from the code perspective, you have access to everything. Just GPS is silent. That, that's all. So we are we, actually the code we are putting in this engineering model is exactly the same code that will be found next year, hopefully. Um, okay. So that, that's important part. There are no there are no uh, flags. There, there there are no uh, flags to switch if you are switching between. Uh, engineering and flight software. If your engineering model is close enough to the flight flight uh, thing, and by close enough, I mean it only has to have the same the memory layout and the same peripherals, then you can use the same code. You don't have to like, uh, for example, disable EPS monitoring because you have no EPS. Well, you have the simulator right now, you can use this. 
So the next step is uh, is is uh, when you start receiving the actual hardware that connects to your uh, onboard computer. Um, so example, in Intuition 1, we received, uh, say, the EPS uh, again two years in the project. So we already were creating the, the software for two years and the rest of the project. And we only then re received a, a physical uh, EPS that will be used on the, on the mission. And uh, what we could, what we did, well, and we, well, what you can do with, with with Oryx tools is that you can now disable the single simulator uh, uh, on the Oasis. So say Oasis, if if there's a request to to this EPS on this address, just just don't answer. The EPS will do that for you. And we can now have like a hybrid flat set where some of the uh, some of the uh, devices are still simulated in Python, and some of them are uh, there for you. And uh, so, what you can do with this? Well, we, you can like very you can again run the integrated software. You can you can have a step by step verification of each device that you're connected to, and you can verify your simulators if they work correctly as well, which is very important. If you find some discrepancy, you go back, change the simulator to behave the same way, see if you see the same results and fix it, right? So um, uh, so this way you're not only verifying the flight software, but you're also verifying the test suit. And you end up, uh, after this, you end up with a test suit that has been verified against the fl flight, flight components uh, and can be used afterwards. And that's why we have the five, uh, the fifth uh, stage, which I think many people during the project forget that after the launch, you will still probably need to work with the system. You know, uh, it is normal to have some updates to, 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 to oh, it is normal that during the operations of your, of, of your mission, you will able, you will prepare some patches, you will prepare some procedures that you want to be able to verify on ground before executing them. Uh, on uh, on an actual hardware in space. So a very common approach is to have a flight uh, flight spares, but this is very uh, costly uh, thing to do. So um, most of organizations I know uh, cannot afford having a flight spare lying around for five years. Even if they have a flight spares, they will use it probably for another project in a year or two, or it will fail to function when needed. Uh, so uh, with this approach, you get a fully running, uh, fully fu fully capable uh, test environment, even without the, uh, the actual flight spares, because you have verified the simulators against, against the, the flight hardware. So uh, if you want to, for example, update your software, you want to, uh, you want to uh, send uh, some patch, then you can check if on ground it works correctly. You can integrate this run on your on 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 ground um, setup with hardware model only and, and simulated devices. And if, it okay, and if it's okay, you can be quite confident that it will work on uh, on on the actual hardware in space as well. Okay, so. Uh, to kind of sum up this part, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm a bit running out of time, so I, will, I but this is the most important thing probably I wanted to, to tell, is that the big part of Oryx is about uh, like integrating into your mission flow, into what how you how you approach flat set, how you approach integration test, how you uh, how you uh, verify that your functionality with different devices works okay. So in what I've presented you so far, used our QM quite extensively, which is a part of our tool chain. We all, the tool chain also has like compile, linker, and other tools that we commonly use, but the QM is the most important part. QM is open source project. You can actually uh, download it uh, freely. There is a version that we have modified a bit and it's available publicly on our GitHub uh, from KP Labs. So you can check it out you, yourself, even without uh, using uh, Oryx. Uh, we we supply the Python simulator API, so uh, an ability for you to easily write the, the simulators for your devices. Uh, if you are using devices that we already work with, we actually have the simulators already uh, available and can uh, share them with you. And we have an Oasis EGSC, which which connects those two worlds, to, connects the the, the simu simulated world with the actual uh, hardware platform. Uh, 
But as you probably uh, already uh, noticed, I haven't talked about the, the 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 thing that was first in the in the introduction to Oryx. That is the C++ uh, modules libraries. Uh, this is the topic that we could probably talk alone for hours because every module is uh, is a big story here. Uh, needless to say, there are we have currently I think uh, almost. 60 or 70 uh, modules that can be reused in the project. So each, each uh, okay, so the, the modules, what is the module? This is a C++ library. It's as a static library that uh, you can use in your project. Uh, and they provide a wide variety of, of functionality that you can use to create the flight software itself. So not to, to test the flight software, but to actually build the fu functionality in the flight software. And it implements quite typical functions. So uh, we have uh, we have a module that uh, lets you build and housekeeping uh, uh, functionality for for your software scheduling, uh, various communication uh, functions. This is a big topic usually. Uh, so communications through radio, but also communications with other subsystems, for example, using CubeSat, uh, CubeSat uh, space protocol, uh, stuff like that. We have an uh, onboard uh, script engine that's based on Lua. Uh, so you can actually uh, have uh, like a limited capability of running your own scripts, your own programs, even on a very limited pl platforms like Cortex-Ems. Uh, we have ready to use file systems. Uh, so for example, if you have a NAND that you want to use like big four, four giga, eight gigabytes, uh, NAND uh, is quite common right now. We have a file system that that you can use for that. Uh, there is a module for, uh, for building a fault detection, and uh, probably many others that wouldn't fit on this slide. Um, we have worked already with with different platforms, so we have a ready to use uh, drivers for for those platforms that are compatible with all this approach. So you can easily swap them with a QMU implementation back and forth to to do the automatic testing and to uh, to uh, to run them under QMO and under the, the hardware platform. Um, most of our code is based on, if it needs uh, some kind of like synchronization or queuing, it ba it's based on free RTS. Uh, however, we have a uh, um, OS abstraction layer in place. So in, in theory, this it is, it is possible to um, compile it against other RTSs. However, we haven't done it. Uh, if you would like to run this on more capable platform like Linux, again we haven't done it. This is more targeted for a, for a, for a, like bare metal platforms. We have uh, run it on Cortex M's, Cortex R's. Uh, we have run it on uh, Spark. We have run it on Microblazes, uh, AVRs. I'm probably missing something, but there's a lot of our variety that we've already tried and be able to to run it. Uh, the, the crucial uh, the crucial libraries here have already flown. They have flight heritage. Uh, we use them on PWSAT two mission. Uh, however, many of the, uh, the of the of the libraries will be used for the first time on Intuition one uh, and uh, our other missions that are being will be flown next year. So, if you want to have more details, again, uh, let us know, and uh, we could like schedule another meeting and go into much more details uh, with that. Um, okay, so if we took a single module, for example, housekeeping from that picture, uh, when I when I say module, it's not on the library precompiled. If of course it's a header, so you, you can like link it and use the use the code from that library. But we also provide a common file, so you can actually uh, we usually host this ourselves, but you can host it yourself, uh, host a common server. For those of you who are not familiar with Conan, this is. Uh, package version manager for C++ that's gaining a lot of attention recently. It's, I think, one of the most, uh, one of the two most uh, popular package managers. So it deals with the topics of dependency management, version management, and stuff like that. And it's very convenient to use it because if we, for example, update some of the library, we can say, you, yeah, there's an updated li library available to you. And if you are using Conan, you can just uh, update your, uh, your version in Conan file and it will be automatically used uh, for you. And of course, documentation, that's also a part of the, each, each package, uh, how to use it. So uh, just to wrap things uh, up a bit, 
Uh, this is a Conan file. So th 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 this uh, this this is the file that says what are the uh, what are the modules being used in a, in a project. And this is a screenshot I took uh, probably just a half an hour ago uh, or an hour ago from uh, from uh, our Intuition One project. Uh, so you can see there are loads of uh, different functionality being bring to this project. So the project, the Intuition One project itself is very, is, well, it's not very small, but it's comparably small piece. Uh, and its main role is to kind of uh, stitch together all those modules. So it says, okay, so for example, there's a sch scheduling module. So here's your buffer to work with a scheduler. So you will have like limit for 1000 entries in the scheduler. Uh, and stuff like that. So, so the the final mission code only kind of configures those modules, uh, pulls them and configures them uh, for your needs. So in the end, you can focus on the mission, on the science, or whatever your mission is doing, uh, and only configure the the functionalities you 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 want. Uh, also, uh, as, as a, just a final example, what you are uh, what is uh, possible to build using all this approach and all those two toolings that we uh, that we provide uh, is one of the tests that we have uh, again for uh, for power supply uh, integration in Intuition One. So uh, this is the kind of automated test that we run on almost every change. No, not every change. Sorry, for on every push that is going to our uh, code repository, uh, there are few hundreds if not thousands over thousand tests that will run on uh, both QMO and uh, hardware and uh, for example this test will 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 check if we uh, if we uh, trigger specific channel in the EPS we will actually see the power cycle of the of the of the onboard computer and that's without actually having an EPS and we can run this test again if we have the EPS and see if, if the simulator uh much as the behavior okay uh, that's all from me uh, um, so th there is a lot of take from this i think and uh, hopefully you have like an overview of what we are proposing so different tools to obtain this this flow of uh, of development and flow of integration in your project uh, if you need more information on the Oryx itself, we have uh, we have a dedicated website on our uh, on our company site. Also, SatSearch has uh, some more details on the Oryx. Um, there's like a PDF leaflet to, to to download, which has probably more like technical details on what platforms are supported and, and stuff like that. Uh, if you wish to uh, like schedule a demo or something, again you can uh, you can contact us. You can contact us uh, directly through mail or through uh, such search uh, 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 website. Uh, and yeah, uh, so uh, do we have any questions that I could answer? I know I, I'm I'm stretched this time a bit already. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Martin. That was. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, don't worry about the time. Obviously, if people need to, to drop off, that's no problem. Um, but yeah, really grateful for that. Um, please, guys, do let us know if you if you do have uh, any questions. Um, I do have some, if we could, to, to kick things off. Um, you discussed the importance of building um, subsystem simulators and, and spent some time on that. What do you do if you're building one based on a third-party unit and they, they change things about how the highway would operate or if there's confidentiality involved they don't want to give you all the details yeah okay so um uh, so first of all uh, it's normal it's a right. very typical <laughs> practice uh, so uh, our usual flow is that uh, when we have when the when the when the mission has already like chosen some of the subsystems so for example we've chose the eps that's that's the example for of the demo. So we choose the EPS. Uh, we receive the the documentation for the uh, EPS. You have to receive the ICD for that. You have to have right. the interface documentation. If you don't, you, you have to you have to somehow obtain it from them. Uh, now, of course, the ICDs are different in every case. Uh, somehow they are, sometimes they are really good. We we had uh, we had work with uh, with uh, suppliers that 
really we, we we've created the simulator based only on the ICD. We then uh, we then uh, received the the, the the product that was uh, ADCS uh, board. We we plugged it in and everything worked as as, as told. And it was wow, <laughs> nobody believed it. <laughs> so uh, it happens. Uh, what if they change something? Well, uh, again, we usually, if we see ch changes in the documentation, we will go and uh, first make them on the simulators. Then we can run our code and see if it broke something, if not. And then we can adjust our drivers to work with the, the new change. Uh, we usually kind of tag, you know, so we have like a support for different, uh, for different um, uh, versions, but uh, I think th that's not really needed usually, but yeah, generally, if you change something, that we are in a good situation because we can kind of uh, it, okay. If they change something after the, the you've seen the um, let's call it let's call the the flight uh, hardware right. That that's the, I think that's the worst situation that can happen. So you 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 have a, a AIV you integrated with some version of the software and they said yeah you know just uh, we've dropped a new version but it will be okay. <laughs> uh, well. Uh, Again, if you don't if you don't have access to the to the to the hardware to verify your simulator, then you have to be careful. But again, simulator is there to help you uh, if you if you need it. Uh, but uh, it's good to have a good cooperation with your suppliers because very often they will give you okay. So uh, we have a one instance in our office, so we can like kind of uh, lend it for you even remotely. We have done such such things uh, in the past. So they, for example, they have. Uh, very very similar module that you didn't just have some some part of the electronics that we didn't use and they would just send us uh, for one week we just test it quickly say yeah okay and our simulators are still okay and uh, and send it back so if you are for example inside the EU that's pretty simple so if you have, we are yeah. from Poland we had like a French supplier it was really simple if you ha have to go through through customs then it becomes a bit, bit more complicated especially for double use uh, items. Uh, but it's doable, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we've got a question there in the chat that asking if you've tested the system on SOCs like Polifier and Zboard. Okay, so um, our code is somehow related to free RTS. And uh, we are mainly focused on the on the on the onboard computers that run limited <laughs> hard resources, so like Cortex M's, Cortex R's. Uh, as I said, uh, microblazes the the hard the the, the but the, the ones that do, doesn't run Linux. There are free, free microblazes if I remember correctly. So uh, the, this kind of uh, of of hardware platforms. And uh, so no, we haven't tried it, but we have run some of our. It is possible to run this on on Linux. You just need to kind of uh, you are able actually you can run free RTS in Linux it's like a, in an executable it's possible it doesn't make much sense for me I think but it's it's, it's certainly is possible however our main uh, target is the bare metal uh, low really low spec uh, micro microcontrollers um, as an example for PWS2 we were able to get to the size of the uh, final executable to 30 kilobytes. Uh, so that's really, really small, right? And it did a lot of stuff. It, it maintained communication, it maintained watchdogs, it maintained uh, like uh, EPSs and all this stuff systems. So uh, we are talking about that, that kind of platforms, okay? Okay, excellent, thanks. Um, I wondered if you could share a couple of the kind of big lessons you, you learned maybe in the development of uh, Intuition 1 and, and PWSAT 2 as well, or, or just focus on Intuition 1, perhaps up to you. <laughs> big lessons. <Yeah. laughs> uh, okay, I will think for a moment. What kind of big lessons? Uh, so I, I think all of the, what, what I presented is one big lesson. Actually, we we have already have the parts of this uh, system and parts of Oryx um, before Intuition One was was started, and but we, we kind of have lots of lessons learned of how we can approach this uh, uh, starting new. And Intuition One was a fresh start. Right now, we are also uh, implementing this on other missions like WS3 and uh, a few others. So uh, yeah, uh, so I think the, the, the general approach that you want to be uh, in uh, somehow not not dependent on the hardware is the biggest I think thing, and it it saved us uh, for for several times already. 
in PWSA2, for example, we, we have a part of this approach already implemented. We had the simulators for the subsystems and uh, PWSA2 was a university project. They didn't have really money to keep all the spare parts. And after two years, we had to do a software update and we could test this all on the ground before updating and it was great. So uh, yeah, so I, I think that keep, keeping keeping this, um, this this flow with simulators is one, one big uh, lesson learned here. Uh, there are probably many others, but we we'll probably get, get too too much detail. Every mission, no. <laughs> you know? yeah. Every mission there are, I'm sure. And and yeah, as you say, I think it's a really important point, and it's perhaps um, quite easy to to forget that in space how reliant we are on the hardware. But yeah. whereas in terrestrial applications, you would never you would be shocked if if a piece of software was reliant on <laughs> a piece of hardware um, uh, in in today's industry. So um, yeah, that's great. Thank you. And, what if we, if there are any further questions, you know, we're, we're a bit over the time. So if there are any further questions, please do feel free to to get in touch with with Machin, with KP Labs or, or with us. And you have the contact details there. Um, I just want to do a quick little summary of, of the event. Um, sorry, just going to share my screen here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just just very quickly, you know, thank you very much, Machin. It was, it was fantastic. It was great to to uh, understand more about uh, KP Labs flight software. And um, yeah, really interesting to learn about the design principles that um, provide a foundation for the work and the five stages of the project life cycle. I think that's really illuminating and shows what, what's possible, even though, as you say, you keep using the simulators, you keep testing. So um, it's, it's not just a, a step by step, but um, and then how the, tool, how the tool chain works and, and how best to control the flow of information in the sort of applications that you discussed and, and the use cases as well in space missions. So um, yeah, we'd like to say thank you very much from, from us and from all of the audience today. So um, yes, thanks. <laughs> and yeah, that wraps up the event, everybody. Thank you very much to everyone who attended. Just a quick couple of things before we go. Um, for those unfamiliar with, with us at SatSearch, we are the global marketplace for space. And um, we have built an online platform with details of thousands of companies, products and services from well, all around the world, space in the space industry all around the world. If you've got any procurement or trade study requirements, we'd be more than happy to, to discuss and to help you find what you need in today's industry, which is, as I'm sure you are aware, fast moving, uh, constantly changing, and is also um, part of the larger changes we're seeing in the global market. So uh, more than happy to help and discuss anything you need. We've also have, uh, quite a significant content program designed to help inform and, and educate engineers and, and other people in the industry, um, such as yourselves, across all uh, across multiple channels, all, all across uh, uh, the internet. Um, just to mention three very quickly, we have the Space Industry Podcast, which is our regular show uh, with episodes featuring companies from around the world, including people from KP Labs. Um, we've got a weekly email newsletter where we share you know, trend and news stories. Um, our own updates and the updates of our members. And um, we also have an open Slack community where people can, anybody interested can network and, and discuss important topics. And we also share aspects of our news and our work. And we would be more than happy to invite you to join us in, in any of those platforms and indeed any other channels where we're present. So, yeah, thank you again to, to much into KP Labs. And um, we hope to, and, and to everybody who attended today, we hope to see you again soon. And we would like to thank you very much for, for spending time with us. <laughs>